Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our Future Leaders in McKenna Biology uh, seminar series. Today, we are excited to have Linda Irons presenting. Linda is a postdoctoral associate in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Yale University, where she uses computational methods to address questions in vascular mechanobiology. She's currently developing multi-scale models of vascular growth and remodeling in health and hypertension. Before this, she trained as a mathematical modeler and became interested in mechanobiology during her PhD at the University of Nottingham, where she modeled integrin binding dynamics in airway smooth muscle cells under oscillatory loading conditions. The common theme of her research is to use computational models to understand the feedback between mechanical environment and cell behavior. And I'm very excited to hear this talk specifically because I also studied um, some of the oscillatory loading of, of animal cells during my PhD in my prior life as an animal cell biologist. So we're very excited to have you here, Linda, and um, feel free to take the screen and start your talk. Great. Thanks for the introduction. And thanks also to the CMB for the invitation to speak in this seminar series. Um, I'm excited to be able to share some of my postdoc work on the computational modeling of vascular homeostasis and adaptation. So the aorta is a large elastic artery and its purpose is to distribute oxygenated blood from the heart to the systemic circulation. And as a structure, it's very robust in that it experiences loads from blood pressure and flow throughout our lifetimes. But the really important and interesting point is that the cells within the aortic wall are able to sense and respond to these mechanical loads. And their responses are really essential for maintaining its integrity, as well as for allowing it to adapt and respond to perturbations in loading. So within the wall itself, there are three layers. The innermost layer contains a single layer of endothelial cells, which are directly exposed to the blood flow. Then in the media, the middle layer, there are elastin fibers, which give the elasticity to the vessel, and also smooth muscle cells, which can contract and relax to regulate the diameter of the vessel. And these smooth muscle cells can also proliferate, they synthesize collagen, as well as various other proteins and growth factors. In the outer layer, the um, adenine tissue, there are collagen fibers, which provide structural integrity to the wall, and also fibroblasts, which also can synthesize and degrade collagen. And these abilities of the cells to regulate the wall are really the focus of this work. So, before I talk about this in more detail, it's useful to know two key definitions. And the first of these is the wall shear stress. And this is felt on the inner wall of the vessel due to the blood flow. And for a cylinder, it's related to the viscosity of the blood, the flow rate Q, and also the inner radius. So this expression tells us that if viscosity and flow rate are constant, then a narrow vessel or one with a smaller inner radius experiences a higher shear stress than one with a larger radius. The second definition is the intramural stress and here we're interested in the circumferential component which for a cylinder relates to the blood pressure P, also the inner radius again, and the wall thickness H. Um, so this means that a thicker wall basically acts like a reinforcement and reduces the stress. And the reason that these two definitions are important is that there is evidence that healthy vessels are able to alter their inner radius and their thickness in ways that regulate and maintain these values near to constant homeostatic targets. And this is referred to as mechanoadaptation. So how does this work? Um, firstly, I'm going to talk about flow. So let's say you have an initial flow rate Q0, which increases by a scale factor of epsilon. And we can calculate using the previous definition that if the shear stress is to be preserved, the inner radius A must scale with epsilon to the third. And this is regulated by the endothelial cells. And these endothelial cells have been shown 
to produce the vasodilator nitric oxide as shear stress increases. And nitric oxide then diffuses into the media. It causes smooth muscle cells to relax and the radius of the vessel will increase. Similarly, the vasoconstrictor endothelium 1 is downregulated by shear stress, and this has similar effects. It causes um, reduced contraction of the smooth muscle cells. So nitric oxide and endothelium 1 are really working together to restore that target value of shear stress. And this is an example of negative feedback, where an increase in shear stress is opposed firstly by vasodilation, and then over longer timescales by an outward remodeling of the vessel. And this type of feedback is really essential for homeostasis. Next, we can consider a fold change in pressure by scale factor gamma. And we find that for circumferential stress to be restored, there must be a proportional increase in the wall thickness, H. And here, if flow is constant, epsilon is, is just one, but if there is also a change in flow, then this should factor into the new wall thickness. And this has been um, observed in an experimental study in mice. And here, angiotensin II was given for 28 days, where ang 2 infusion is a common model for inducing hypertension, which you can see here um, from the increase in blood pressure over time. And it was observed that there was a corresponding increase in thickness in response to this um, increased pressure, and that this came from increased collagen production and smooth muscle cell mass. And as a result of this, what is seen is that the circumferential stress is increased at early times due to the pressure, but then at later times, the wall thickening um, is able to restore it close to its initial value. So again, there's this negative feedback loop where the change in stress is opposed, this time by production of material and wool thickening. However, from um, a different region of the aorta in the same study, a fibrotic response was seen after the same increase in blood pressure. And this is an example of a maladaptive response where ideal target stresses were not restored. So you see um, an excessive thickening, mainly of collagen in the adventitia, tissue, and a significant reduction in the circumferential stress. And our view is that maladaptation and these disease states result from a loss of homeostatic negative feedback mechanisms, where these mechanisms are ultimately controlled by cellular responses to stress. So these would include the production of vasoactive molecules, as well as the production and removal of collagen and smooth muscle cells. So for this talk, I'm going to describe how we model this process at various scales. Um, and I'm gonna start by describing a logic-based cell signaling model, where the goal was to be able to qualitatively capture known cell responses uh, relevant to vessel growth and remodeling, to changes in pressure-induced intramural stress, flow-induced wall shear stress, and also angiotensin II. In the second part, I'll briefly describe an existing framework for modeling growth and remodeling at the tissue level. This is known as constrained mixture theory. And in the final part, I'll tell you about um, the coupling of these two models to construct a new multi-scale framework that's fully integrated where vessel growth and remodeling is driven by cell signaling events. Okay, so um, let's get started with the cell signaling model. Just to reiterate, we have certain inputs of interest. These are the pressure, the flow, and in some cases, exogenous biochemical stimuli such as NG2. And we also have a set of outputs related to growth and remodeling, which are collagen deposition and removal, cell proliferation and contractility. And our goal is to generate a model of what happens in between these 
so to do this, we began by curating the existing literature. We focused on signaling pathways that were known to respond to mechanical stresses on ANG2, and also those that affect matrix and cell turnover. So in this diagram, we have our inputs up here, and let's first focus on intramural stress and exogenous ANG2. And we have that stress also upregulates ANG2, as well as various growth factors, TGF beta and PDGF. We then consider relevant receptors, um, so the AT1 and AT2 receptors, growth factor receptors, integrins and stretch activated channels. Then within the cell, we're considering um, key pathways such as the MAP kinases, the SMAD pathway, PI3K mTOR, and ROVOX signaling. And the effects of these pathways are considered down here where there could be production of further extracellular proteins, which include MMPs. These are really um, key because they degrade collagen. Also TIMP, which is an inhibitor of MMPs. And then outputs for collagen synthesis, cell proliferation and contractility. Going back up to the top, we also consider um, vasoactive molecules, nitric oxide and endothelium-1, which are regulated by wall shear stress and they can um, kind of enter the signaling network to affect cell contractility, as well as some of these other outputs. So in total, we have 50 nodes in this network, which I'm generally going to refer to as the network species, um, and 82 reactions, which are basically statements about how a species or a combination of species upregulates or inhibits others. Finally, to um, simulate the network dynamics, we use a previously developed logic-based approach, um, which I'll, I'll now take a few minutes to describe in more detail. Okay, so to show the method, I'm going to be using a much simpler five species network. So here we have two inputs A and B, which activate downstream species C and D. There is then a fifth species, E, um, which is activated by C, but inhibited competitively by D. So this could represent some kind of competitive binding. The diagram in this case is translated into a list of three rules or logic statements, which are that A implies C, B implies D, and we say that C and not D implies E. And that's used to model the inhibition. And Although our network is much larger, it can also be represented by a list of logic statements like this. So just again, as a very basic example, in classical Boolean logic, each species would typically take a discrete value of either zero or one, indicating an inactive or an active state. Discrete update steps are then used to propagate the signal through the network. So for example, here we have A equals one and B equals zero. And in the next time step, we would see that C equals one and D equals zero. And then the output E would become active because there is no inhibitor present. Alternatively, if B is present, there's activation of D and the production of um, the output is blocked due to the inhibition. So activation in Boolean logic is a discrete switch. And this can be thought of as a step function. And also in these um, contexts, inhibition is modeled by one minus this function. But for our purposes, we didn't want to be restricted to discrete values. So we follow previous work by Krautler and colleagues where each species in the network is actually normalized by its maximal value. So it can take any continuous value between zero and one. And in this method, instead of this discrete switch, activation is modeled by a continuous whole function. So we have this sigmoidal behavior. And this function has two parameters associated with it. It has the Hill exponent N that controls the steepness of this curve and the EC50, which is the value of X that gives an output of 
Additionally, these activation functions can be scaled by a weight parameter w um, to, scale, to scale the effect or the strength of the effect. So it's common for reactions to also involve multiple species. And these um, hill functions can be extended through the use of logical operators. Um, so a continuous AND operator is used when two species are both required for activation. The OR operator is used for parallel um, or independent paths. And AND not allows us to model inhibition as above. So in this case, the governing equations um, are going to be as follows. So we have time-dependent inputs A and B, which I've prescribed. And the other species are governed by ODEs. So here, species C has that hill function activation by A. It also has a first order decay with time scale tau. And we include this parameter C max, which is going to allow us to simulate external interventions. So by default, this will just be one. But if we wanted to simulate a node's inhibition, this could be reduced to 10% or 50% or even zero to completely remove the node from your network. The equation for D is similar, and for E, we use this and not um, logic to capture the inhibition. And this was a, a small and simple example, but in general, these systems can get quite complex. So it's worth mentioning that Netflix down here is a freely available software that can be used to automatically generate these systems of ODEs from any list of logic statements. So this makes it a very efficient and flexible formulation to use. Okay, so we spent some time constructing and tuning our model and then looked at a number of case studies for validation. Um, in the interest of time today, I'm just going to show one case study that I think has an interesting result where the model really gave us some additional insight. And in the study that we're considering, the authors were looking at the combined effects of pressure and ANG2 on MMPs. And this is worth understanding because pressure and ANG2 are both elevated during hypertension, and MMPs will degrade collagen and potentially alter wall thickness during remodeling. So they took thoracic aortic rings and subjected them to three levels of pressure with or without ANG2. And it was observed that the qualitative response that ANG2 had on MMPs differed according to the applied pressure and also the MMP subtype. So for MT1 MMP, at the lowest pressure, addition of ANG2 led to increased um, MMP activity. Whereas at these higher pressures, um, it led to decreases. For MMP2, ANG2 elevated MMP activity. And for MMP9, it led again to decreases. So in our model, we have stress and exogenous ANG2 as inputs and via various pathways, mainly MAP kinases, SMAD and AKT, they have an effect on these um, MMP subtypes that we consider. Um, also of interest is TIM because it inhibits MMP activity and it's upregulated by the SMAD pathway. So to try to gain some intuition about these species, we simulated the full range and different combinations of stress and ANG2 inputs. And we noticed that the values of TIMP, which inhibits MMPs, strictly increases with both of these inputs. But in contrast, the MMPs in our model showed a more complex non-monotonic behavior, which in fact is due to these high levels of inhibitors. So if we take MMP9 as an example, we can look at a consequence of this. And to do this, we take cross sections of this surface at different levels of stress. And we see that if you begin from a low stress state, 
to 0.2, which is the solid line, um, the addition of FANG2 will initially give an increase, but then at higher doses, decrease. And if you start at a higher stress state, which is nearer to the peak of this surface, addition of ANG2 only leads to decreases. So we don't know for sure where the experimental pressures in ANG2 dose would map onto these zero to one normalized ranges. But by choosing two different starting points on the surface, we can illustrate qualitatively that both types of experimental outcomes can be obtained due to this underlying structure or shape of that surface. And in this first case, it relies on activation always dominating over the inhibiting species. Whereas in the second case, um, it tells us that there must be an inhibitor present that is also upregulated by stress in ANG2, and that at some point that inhibitor overtakes and begins to dominate the behavior. So this highlights several things. The first is really um, the added insight that can be gained from considering multiple stimuli and multiple doses. It's, it's very common to see only a single magnitude of perturbation tested, but we show that even qualitatively, the reported outcome could change, or perhaps some interesting behavior could be missed. Related is the need to carefully consider um, the baseline conditions, including the mechanical state, because these can also change the qualitative responses. So I'm going to conclude this first part by just saying that we have developed and validated a new cell signaling model relevant to arterial growth mean modeling. And the logic-based approach that we use is a really flexible way of modeling these systems. And we'll see more examples of this later. Okay, so I'm now going to take um, a few minutes to explain a previous modeling framework that has been used to describe the tissue level mechanics of the aorta. And this is important because instead of just prescribing those input levels of stress and wall shear stress into our signaling model, we want realistic changes that have been calculated using the specific material properties and the geometry of a real vessel. So what we're looking for is to be able to give an input, which is a change in pressure or a change in flow, and to get as an output how the vessel deforms and how those stresses have changed. And this relies on several things. It relies on the initial geometry of the vessel, and it relies on the specific materials within the vessel and their distinct mechanical properties. And for this, we use something called a constrained mixture approach, where we consider collagen, elastin, and smooth muscle cells in some proportions that can be determined from histology. And these proportions are captured in constituent mass densities. We then also have constituent specific stored energy functions for each component, accounting for their different material properties. And the subscripts alpha here just refer to each of the constituents. A major challenge of modeling the mechanics of biological tissues, though, is that there is a continuous turnover of materials. So these constituent mass densities have the potential to evolve over time. And this enters the formulation through this hereditary integral in the stored energy function. Um, which basically just captures the past production and removal of each constituent. So M here is a mass production rate. Q is called a survival function, which takes a value between zero and one. And it describes the proportion of material deposited at time tau that survives at time S. And I'll show um, some specific functional forms of these in a few slides. For um, completeness, these are the functional forms for the stored energy um, for each constituent, where I really just want to highlight one point, which is that they contain material parameters for each constituent that need to be determined for a given vessel or a given sample. 
So this determination is done using an established biaxial mechanical testing protocol in our lab where excised vessels are cannulated and they can then be pressurized as well as stretched axially. And the protocol is for vessels to be pressurized at three different levels of axial stretch. And from here, a, a family of pressure diameter curves can be collected. They are then also stretched at four levels of pressure, which generates a family of four stretch curves. And together, these seven curves provide the information needed to fit those unknown material parameters in the stored energy functions. Going back to the mass turnover, this has for a long time been modeled phenomenologically, where there is a basal rate of mass production of each constituent, which can be modulated by something called um, a stimulus function here in the brackets. And these stimulus functions are based on experimental observations where both collagen and smooth muscle cell production have been observed to increase with stress, um, sigma, and decrease with wall shear stress. And the sensitivity or the extent of these changes can be tuned using these gain parameters. For the removal of collagen and smooth muscle cells, we use an exponential decay. Again, there is some basal removal rate, this time modulated by stress deviations. And just to emphasize, these forms are used for collagen and smooth muscle cells. The elastin in our model is actually assumed to be constant and not turnover. And this is due to its long half-life of approximately 50 years, which is much longer um, than collagen and smooth muscle cells, which is on the order of 70 days. And these models have worked very well to simulate various data sets by fitting different material parameters and different gain parameters. But the main limitation which we're trying to address is that these gain parameters don't tell us anything about the mechanisms behind this mechanoregulated turnover. So this leads to the third part of the talk where I'm going to tell you about how we've extended this approach into a multi-scale modeling framework. So we begin again with changes in pressure and flow. The tissue level constrained mixture model is used to calculate those realistic stress deviations. And we take these and use them as inputs into our cell signaling model. We evolve the cell signaling ODEs to find out how the relevant outputs change, um, which are collagens, MMPs, proliferation, apoptosis, and contractility. And the first four of these are used to provide more mechanistic mass turnover relations. And the contractility is used to update the active stress generated by smooth muscle cells. And this feeds into the tissue level model, it leads to altered stresses and geometry. And there is now this um, feedback loop or a full bidirectional coupling between the two previous modeling frameworks. So just to show you these differences, here is the new mass turnover rate, where, as I mentioned, we use direct outputs of the cell signaling model. So cell proliferation and collagen synthesis. Oops. And for removal, we use apoptosis and MMPs, where we can sum the different MMP subtypes. We also allow the network contractility output to be used um, as an active stress term, which is solved during the tissue level equilibrium equations. So we validated this framework by fitting to experimental data from a mouse model of ANG2 induced hypertension. Um, and here we tuned the cell signaling parameters to produce the known steady state values of collagen and smooth muscle cells from histology. And then we predicted changes in thickness and axial stress, which were, which were very good um, fits to the experimental data. And here you see the increase in thickness with pressure, which is able to reduce the, um, the elevated stress. We found that the predictions for the inner radius were reasonably good at early times, although underestimated at the last two um, 
time point slightly. And we think that this is due to the fact that the model does not yet account for inflammation, which was seen at low levels in the experimental data and can have this effect. Um, but overall, we were reasonably happy with this bit. So the experimental data set was one validation, but it only dealt with one level of pressure elevation and constant flow. So our next goal was to be able to look at a larger range of flow and pressure perturbations and verify the behavior in these cases. And to do this, we generated some synthetic data using the previous phenomenological model. And again, um, this has been a very successful model in many cases. So we really wanted our coupled model to be able to generate similar predictions. So here I'm showing five levels of pressure changes from 10 through 50%. And we fit the model to the case in green of a 30% increase. Then we compared predictions for other magnitudes where the synthetic data is shown in the dashed lines and the model in the solid lines. And the two models are in very close agreement for these five cases and also for a further 10 where we considered different combinations of pressure and flow. The real value though comes from the fact that we can now track the behavior of every intermediate network species. And here I just show a few examples where the top row illustrates how there were transient stimuli for the mass turnover outputs, which then settled to zero as a steady state was reached. In the bottom left, we see an increase in ANG2 due to a simulated exogenous input but then also additional stress-driven levels. And I've included the basal active molecules here because they actually illustrate this multi-scale coupling really nicely. And this is because pressure does not influence them in the network model alone, but it does transiently increase the inner radius of the vessel, which leads to reduced shear stress. And when this shear stress feeds back into the cell signaling model, we see this drop in NO and increase in ET1. So we're feeling good about the functionality of the model and are now beginning to think about how we can use it to learn more about mechanoadaptation um, and the apparent robustness of homeostatic vessels. And this next set of simulations revolves around this question of whether we're able to parameterize our model um, and use it to understand those ideal geometric adaptations that we discussed at the beginning of the talk, where inner radius and thickness evolve in ways shown here, which allow the intramural stress and wall shear stress to return to target values. And for this, we're going to consider three levels of pressure increase and three levels of flow increase to have kind of six total perturbations. So at the tissue level, since we're considering a healthy homeostatic state, we use material parameters for mature wild type mice. Um, and then we aim to fit the remaining cell signaling parameters to obtain this geometric adaptation for those six pressure and flow perturbations. Unlike the previous cases though, we found that there was not a best fit parameter set for the cell signaling parameters, but actually we found that there were a wide range of parameters that could produce very um, well regulated adaptive responses um, with the distributions of these parameters shown here. And because of this, we decided that we would study the ensemble effects. So this means that we took all of the 250 candidate parameter sets. We simulated them all and we studied their mean predictions and variability. So these are the tissue level responses to three different levels of pressure increase. And the mean values are shown by the solid lines and the shaded region in each case shows the standard deviation from the mean over these 250 parameter sets. And you can see that um, the thickness and the inner radius, they vary more at early times, 
but by these later times, they are very well regulated with very low variability. And actually they settle close to these asterisks, which denote those ideal adaptations. And we also saw equivalently well-regulated responses to flow. So to understand this result, it becomes useful to look at how each parameter set affects the network or the signaling sensitivities to stresses. And we begin with how intramural stress and wall shear stress affect the stimuli for mass production. So let's first focus on this top figure. Um, if we begin at zero, zero, which is the homeostatic state baseline stresses, we see that the stimulus for collagen production is increased, which is shown in orange, by positive stress perturbations and decreased by positive wall shear stress perturbations. And the same is true for smooth muscle cells, but with um, different sensitivities. And this is consistent with the previous phenomenological stimulus functions. So we, what we can do is we can actually fit those previous functional forms of approximations to our signaling surface, uh, signaling like sensitivity surfaces. And this gives us approximate gain parameters that could be used in like the equivalent tissue level model. So we have values um, for the stress gain and the shear stress gain that best represent the network outputs. And if we look at the difference between the two, um, we see that this linear approximation is actually very good. So these, um, these magnitudes are very small, although they do grow as the magnitude of the perturbation increases. And this is expected. This is because the network responses which are built around hill functions tend to saturate and they're not linear, whereas the linear forms will continue to increase indefinitely. And if we do this fitting for each of our candidate parameterizations, what we find are these clouds of gain parameters that produce adaptive responses. And this does make sense because what is found is that the lower gain parameters, they're less sensitive to the stresses and they take longer to adapt and that's reflected in that increased variability at early times at the tissue level. But the general type of behavior is correct. And there is this ongoing feedback between the stresses and mass production, which eventually is able to drive the system to the adaptive state. Of course, there's a limit to this. And we find that if all of the gains are too low, then the vessel does not respond well to stresses. And in these cases, we see maladaptive responses. We then wanted to consider the robustness of the homeostatic state to perturbations of the network structure, including the removal of different nodes to represent either a pharmacological inhibition or a mutation. For example, here we could simulate the administration of Lysartan which is a clinically used drug for hypertension that inhibits the AT1 receptor. And this idea was based on several studies where inhibitors or knockouts were given or induced in healthy, mature, wild-type mice. And the story always seemed to be that there were no significant changes in various tissue level metrics, including inner radius or thickness or composition. And this indicates that there's a certain robustness or fault tolerance to the homeostatic state under baseline conditions, baseline um, pressures and flows. So one of those inhibitors was the satin. As I just mentioned, this inhibits the AT1 receptor. And under these baseline pressure and flow conditions, so we have constant um, pressure and flow here, we conduct the same knockout at time zero and this is the most exciting figure, but we find that there are really no noticeable effects at the tissue level. And also when we look at the network species, very low magnitude changes at the cell level. And the red lines here um, indicate the experimental time point of six months where 
thickness, diameter, and collagen were measured and found to have not changed. The row kinase knockdown is slightly more interesting because here contractility is affected and you see at early times this um, small increase in the inner radius and in the stress due to this loss of contractility. But at later times, we see that there is a slight thickening of the vessel and an inward remodeling where the inner radius is trying to um, come back to its initial value. And we think that this could be an attempt of the vessel to compensate this loss of contractility and to restore the target stresses. And this is reflected in the cell level readouts. So you see the reductions in contractile species such as myosin light chain kinase, actin, and the contractility outputs. But we also see upregulation of the MAP kinases, PI3K mTOR, um, and collagen and cell proliferation. So, um, so we think that this idea of compensation, which is driven by feedback from the tissue level um, stresses, is a really interesting one to consider. Finally, um, in addition to considering the effects of these mood knockdowns under baseline conditions, we also want to understand how they affect the mechanoresponsiveness of the vessel. And for this, we come back to the idea of fitting to phenomenological gain parameters. But this time, we propose an alternative phenomenological stimulus function, which is modulated by this additional term delta. And this accounts for altered mass production under baseline stresses due to the change in the network structure. So I'm going to use the same example as earlier, where we had determined these approximate gain parameters under baseline conditions. Um, here, baseline means the full network structure. It hasn't been um, altered. And here we see how these surfaces are altered with the AT1 receptor knockout and a TGF beta receptor knockout. And the first thing to look at are the baseline effects, um, meaning the baseline um, stresses, so the homeostatic pressure and flow, because in this first case, the values of the stimulus function is one, the production does not change, whereas with the knockouts, you can see or you can quantify how much you expect the basal mass production to be reduced in this case, which for the AT1 receptor was very small, only 3% for collagen, 2% for smooth muscle cells. And in the TGF beta case, it was 6% for collagen, 3% for smooth muscle cells. And these very small changes seem consistent with the tissue level time courses, where we really couldn't observe any real differences um, in either of these cases under homeostatic pressure and flow. But it's very interesting to also consider how the gains or the stress sensitivities are affected. Because here with the AT1 receptor knockout, there is um, approximately a 13% reduction in the stress-mediated collagen gain and about a 40% reduction in the TGF beta case. And interestingly, in both of these, the sensitivities to wall shear stress are not really affected. And this partial reduction to sensitivity to stress seems consistent with an experimental study of transverse aortic constriction or TAC. Um, and this is a surgical procedure that is used as a model for pressure overload in the heart, but it also leads to increased pressure and remodeling in the ascending aorta. And wall thickness and collagen were observed to increase after TAC. However, um, when treated with Lasartan before the surgery, there was still some thickening seen and some increase in collagen, but to a reduced extent. And I've shown these results because when it comes to inhibitors or external interventions, I think it's really important to think about two aspects. And the first is the baseline effect under homeostatic conditions, but secondly, the potential effect that 
a treatment might have on the vessel's ability to respond to perturbations, which with this method, we can separate very clearly into a baseline effect, a um, intramural stress effect, and a wall shear stress effect. And this could be important because as for this AT1 receptor case, if you only look at the baseline conditions, you might think that a given treatment has no effect. But when subject to a perturbation, actually there is a difference. And depending on the context, this might be a desirable change or an undesirable one. For example, if it impairs the ability of the vessel to adapt when needed. So in conclusion, having this multi-scale framework in place is a really important step in being able to understand the feedback between cell signaling and tissue level mechanics during vessel remodeling. Now that we have validated the modeling framework, we're able to explore some possible effects of signaling perturbations. And the logic-based approach especially is very flexible for this. In our study of mechanoadaptation, we found that adaptive responses were driven by negative feedback between stresses and mass production. And that because of this ongoing feedback, a range of signaling parameters could actually yield an adaptive response. And at first we, we thought this was problematic. We couldn't determine best fit parameters, but actually we think that this might be an important feature from a robustness of cell heterogeneity point of view. Finally, um, the homeostatic state was robust to several node knockdowns, but these knockdowns could affect how the vessel is able to respond to future perturbations. So this is definitely an area to be explored in more detail. So I'd like to thank um, Humphrey Lab members past and present who have um, been engaged in many helpful discussions about this work especially Jay and also Anna and Marcos who have collaborated on some of the work um, presented today. In terms of software, just a quick note um, on the cell signaling model, the code for generating those systems of ODEs from logic statements is called NetFlux, it's freely available, as is the specific model used here. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you for listening and I'll be happy to take any questions. Um, I, I'm, I'm, Annie, I hope you're here. I'm very sorry. I, 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 I couldn't get online, um, on, on, until, until relatively, uh, late. Um, but thank you very much for the talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I have a I have, question. I, Oops. Go ahead. Yasta. Okay, well, thanks so much. Uh, it was uh, quite elegant. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to ask something. It's somewhat unorthodox when people give presentations on homeostasis, but if you don't mind, um, is it completely necessary sort of a priori to assume that the stress is the set point? Because where would this set point reside? Uh, that is the the attempt of regulating stress or normalizing it is is really what goes on or is the stress you know be it shear or wall stress is an emergent property meaning that the system is is drawn or is pulled as as if it was an attractor and mm -hmm. so is there a way because the model is so robust and so intellectually honest that i, I wonder if you can even attempt at answering this vague question. Thank you. Yeah, wow, that's that's a very good question. And so you say, is it necessary from the modeling point of view? Yes, it's necessary to identify um, what that regulated variable is. But I guess more conceptually, it's true. What, what are the cells actually sensing? Um, um, and we always kind of discuss that, I mean, the cells Aren't, aren't calculating these stresses in the same way that we are the circumferential component or the wall shear stress. So 
it's, it's probably not the exact metrics that we use, but it does appear to correlate very well to those metrics. Um, but of course, yeah, it's, it's probably much more complex. Thank you very much. I had a question about the scale of the model as it relates to cell signaling. So um, I'm familiar in, in the plant cell biology field with models that, that try to understand the mechanical properties of individual cells, right, which are analogous in some ways to the um, arterial tissue that you're studying. And we're trying to integrate those with some of the signaling model models, logic-based signaling models that are out there for the responses of these cells to stimuli. So do you have to make any considerations or translations between the signaling that's happening at the individual cell level and potential variability between cells in the tissue and the mechanics of, of what you're studying at the tissue level? Yeah, so. So of course, there's a lot of complexity in these models that, that is not considered. We kind of, as the starting point, just really tried to build a very minimal model of the, the relevant pathways. Um, one of the future goals is to expand into more detail of individual cell um, type signaling, so like a more detailed endothelial cell component, smooth muscle cell component, um, that can incorporate more of that detail. For now, this, this was a good starting point, but in terms of complexity, I guess you can always you can always add more. Um, at the cell level, the struggle there is finding the data to be able to parameterize and um, yeah, really understand that model. Thank you. So, I, I, sorry, I wonder if I could ask a sort of re related question: Is is the from the point of view of complexity, is there a a um, uh, I mean, presumably you want this to model human vasculature and, and uh, but, but is, is there a sort of a experimental minimal um, endothelialized tube that is, that people have, you know, have lots of data on that can be, that can be mo modeled and maybe someone like Yasha might know, but, but is there some sort of minimal physical system early in evolution or in a model organism that, that could be informative. That's interesting. Um, and I, I wish I could provide you a solid answer. Um, that's something that I would love to know more about. Um, that's that's the major challenge with parameterizing these models is trying to find that kind of quantity of data. So if anyone knows, I'll be happy to. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I wonder about that. I mean, since, since, you know, you know, in the center, people have been looking at all, you know, a vast range of different uh, organisms. I don't even know that. Is there a kind of a, sim a, a, a simplest, um, you know, flowing tube system in some animal, plant, fungus, God, you know, who knows what that, that, that is, is a kind of a starting point. Yeah, yeah, I don't know, it just, it just occurred to me. Um, and any other questions? Okay. If if not, then then thanks very much for for this 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 talk.